Morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and uh, stand together, sing a couple uh, songs as we uh, as we start our night tonight. Let's praise the Lord together. <clears throat> and hopefully the words follow me. I did not look at this, so if it doesn't, we'll just go ahead. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter, the King of glory, the King above all kings? Who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings? This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me.
sun, the lion and the lamb, the lion and the lamb. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Good evening. I'm glad you came out to worship the Lord tonight. It's uh, great to have you here. It's great to have the Christ family with us. And uh, Mike, thank you for taking the message this evening. I appreciate that. Take the night off. And uh, I know whenever Mike gets up here, we'll, he'll break off a healthy portion of sound doctrine and a healthy portion of the word for us. So I'm thankful, brother. Looking forward to the message. Not to put any undue pressure on you. I want to begin with a reading from Matthew 27, beginning in verse 51, and then we'll have our prayer time. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. And when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what had taken place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. You know, I'll never get over that scene, that image of the rent veil of the torn curtain, which symbolizes that by his death, Jesus opened up a way for sinners to have fellowship with God, that we can enter the Holy of Holies through Christ and by virtue of his blood. Um, would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your grace that you've bestowed upon us. Thank you for your love, which you have shared with us and brought us into. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that's given us new hearts and that strengthens us day to day and that will sustain us to the end according to your promise. Father, thank you for the church. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for your kingdom and all that you're doing in the world. And we lift this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In terms of prayer requests, I already have a few up here, but I also want to take prayer requests from you. So what can I pray for, church? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. I'll pray for that. Who else? Yes, Sarah. My dad's getting ready to ramp up his summer with a couple of, like, five BI students, five institute students from Word of Life. And they'll be traveling a lot throughout the summer on and off constantly. So just pray for safety and our hearts to be open to the gospel. These evangelistic campaigns, basically, the traveling or? Yeah. yeah. Great. We'll do it for sure. 
Anyone else? We'll pray for her. Mike, I already told you ahead of time I'm putting you on the spot, so I don't know if this qualifies as putting you on the spot, but how can we pray for uh, your family and, and on the mission field and the work going on in Africa? It's fair game during prayer time, brother. Um, yeah, so we are, uh, we have busy travel coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're going to see some friends in uh, Virginia uh, next this, this coming week, and then we go to Colorado for a retreat for missionary families um, the following week. So you can pray that that would be um, just a, a good time of refreshing and relaxing and connect with other people who are doing, doing similar, uh, sim similar kind of um, life. Uh, appreciate your prayer for the work in Kenya. We are just encouraged. Last time you were all here, uh, you heard um, Salian, who talked way better than I can about. Anyway, he was um, he was so encouraged by his time here with you guys, and so bring greetings from him. Um, and uh, yeah, the work is, is the school, the institute that we have is moving along um, rather rapidly, just because there's such a, a hunger for quality theological education. And that's what we're trying to provide. Um, a specific prayer request would be that we can raise enough money to uh, have our part-time administrator turn into a full-time administrator for 2024, our budget for 2024 uh, for our school, not in terms of the money that is, supports our family, but for the school itself is about uh, uh, 56,000. So uh, I'd love this part of my work here while we're in the U.S. is to be talking with some people about seeing how we can raise that money for the school. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Any other prayer requests? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we continue to pray for Nancy and all of the family and close friends and church family of Mike. Pray that you would comfort her. Pray that you would draw near to her and remind her of your love and care and remind her of the hope um, that she has in Christ and remind her of the reality daily that you have received Mike into glory, into your arms, safe and secure. Father, um, I do also pray uh, for Danny and seeing the orthopedist this week. I pray uh, that, um, that there'll be good news, move, news at least, to move forward and give a plan uh, of action. I pray that same prayer for Ryan regarding his back and um, upcoming appointments for all those who are sick and hurting, I pray that you would comfort them, give healing according to your will and wisdom in all things, give faith and a perspective of hope. Father, we pray for Denise. First of all, thank you that her hospital stay was brief and that she's feeling better. And we thank you that they're able to go on the trip. And we pray for gospel doors to be opened and gospel seeds to be sown and gospel fruit to come about through your ministry uh, through them on this trip. Father, same prayer for Sam and the mission teams and the students in training. Pray for safety and we pray for fruit on these summer campaigns that Christ would be known and that he would be turned to and loved and worshiped and served as is proper. Uh, we pray for Nancy and the surgery this week, that you will keep her strong and healthy to be able to have that surgery, that it would go smoothly. There'll be no infections or setbacks, and they'll have, she'll have a smooth, healthy recovery. And uh, of course, keep her heart and mind fixed on Christ uh, no matter what. Father, we thank you for the Christs, and thank you for bringing them here. Thank you for their work for your kingdom. I pray and we pray for their uh, health on the mission field and their strength inwardly. We pray that you would guard them and protect them and use them in mighty ways, ways far beyond anything that we could ever think to pray for, far beyond anything they've even imagined for fruitfulness, that you would work a great work through them. Father, we pray for 
safety and health, health on the upcoming travels. I pray that you would grant them the refreshing and the rest and the fellowship with other missionaries that they need to be recharged uh, to go back onto the battlefield. Father, we praise you for the growth that the seminary has seen, and we ask you, humbly asking you, according to your power and wisdom, that you would provide the funds for this administrator to go full-time by next year. Father, we uh, thank you that you've brought us together. Thank you that you've given us your word so that we would have something to preach truth from. And Father, we thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit so that as that truth is preached, that we're able to receive it properly, to receive it humbly, to receive it by faith, and to receive it powerfully as you transform us into your image and likeness. Father, as we come to your word now, we ask once again that you would teach us, correct us, and bless us. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. wonderful to uh, have the opportunity to preach here. Um, yeah, it's always good to, uh, to come here, receive, a, a, I know I'll receive a very warm welcome and um, see old friends. So, uh, Matt asked me, Pastor Matt asked me to preach on Romans uh, chapter 6, and I said, how about Romans chapter 7? Because I already have a sermon prepared on that passage. And um, he wanted me to talk about what it means that we would share in Christ's death. This passage does the same thing. Um, I had actually originally prepared this sermon several years ago for a, a conference I did for Kenyan, or for, for really pastors all throughout uh, East Africa. Um, and uh, it, I, I was thankful for the opportunity to look at the, this passage and I think it bore fruit then. So I pray it would be encouraging for you now. So yeah, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6. While you're turning there, I want to set up this passage for you by asking you to think about two questions that I think this passage really develops. First, who are you? That is, what is your identity? At the core of your being, who are you? And second, what do you belong to? I want to suggest that those questions involving identity and belonging are, are really inter, uh, inherently related. They're really kind of the same question. And that's because God made us, at the core of who we are, to belong to something. We are made for covenant fellowship with God and with others. Everybody is. Have you ever noticed that those people who want to be rugged individualists and, you know, be all on their own, look almost exactly like everybody else who wants to be a rugged individualist and look, you know, and, and act all on their own. Even their identity is connected to a community. So if I ask you, who are you? And if you begin to answer that in your head, you might say something like, well, I'm American. Or maybe you'd say, well, I'm from this political party. Or maybe I went to this school. Or maybe, I don't see anybody's doing this, but maybe you'd be wearing a, a football shirt with your team or your hat, with your team on it, and that'll give away who you are. And when your team wins, you say, we won, even though all you did was sit on the sofa and eat nachos, right? We belong to something, and we get our identity from what we belong to. Now, part of the way that belonging gives us an identity is that whatever we belong to has a story which we participate in as we belong. Nations have stories of how they fought for independence. And the generations that come later share in that story as they rehearse that story every year. Through the stories, we learn who our heroes are, who our enemies are. The stories that we find ourselves in are also like lenses through which we see the world. And with those lenses comes sets of expectations. If I belong to a family that excels in athletics, then I've got to be the MVP when it's my turn to 
If I belong to an elite school, I better show how smart I am. If I'm a businessman or woman in, in an important company, I better make a certain amount of money. Or maybe I don't really belong. You ever feel like an imposter? That's probably because you're not living up to the expectations of whatever it is that you belong to. You see, what we belong to can become a cruel master that can crush us and suck the life out of us by making us think that in order to really belong, we just have to work a little bit harder or sacrifice a bit more. Well, this is background for Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. As I read the passage, see if you notice some of those themes of identity and belonging in the passage. Here we go. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person as long as he lives? For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. More literally, the text actually says belongs to another man. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that you may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, and not the old way of the written code. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we pray that you would make this clear and real for us, and that we would, we would inhabit this passage. We would see how the truths in this passage impact our lives, and we would, we would live within the reality of which it speaks. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you noticed, I moved. There was, there was a creek there. I wasn't trying to see somebody. Like, hi. No, no, that's not why. It was the creaking sound there that was distracting me. Okay, did you see themes of identity and belonging in that passage? Uh, belonging is, is there, obviously, right? We belong to Christ. That's clear. Identity is implicit from the context. Chapter 6 explains our identity. It explains what kind of people we are when we are in Christ. It, Paul explains what kind of people we are to answer the question, should we continue to sin that grace may abound? And his answer is no, because we are the kind of people who have died and are risen with Christ. Sin is inconsistent with our identity. That's Paul's argument in chapter 6. The point of chapter 6 is that now we need to live in light of our identity in Christ. Paul tells us to present ourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead. The best summary statement of sanctification I've heard is that we are in Christ. We are, sanctification is about becoming who we already are in Christ. It's about living out our identity. That's what chapter 6 is about. However, Paul knows that there is something that will prevent you from being who you are in Christ. And that is, if you are acting as though you still belong to the law. Paul says, el Paul says elsewhere that the power of sin is the law. You cannot belong to the law and live out your identity in Christ at the same time. Think of the person, perhaps you, <laughs> it's all of us to some degree, who truly believes the gospel and really loves Jesus. But when it comes to actually living out the Christian life, that person is always ranking themselves according to how they feel they're doing or, or thinking about whether or not they've made enough progress or comparing themselves to others. And so they are always living with a sense of failure and shame or being smug and self-righteous. 
which is the act, exact opposite of who they are in Christ. You can't live out your identity of Christ if you see yourself as belonging to the law. So chapter 7 of Romans builds on chapter 6 by helping us understand that if we are in Christ, the law is no longer our master. We no longer live under the jurisdiction of the law. So that's, that's what the passage is doing in brief. I want to look more particularly at three things from this passage. Um, one, how Christ breaks us free from the law. Two, what kind of identity we have in belonging to Christ. And three, how then shall we live? First, how Christ breaks us free from the law. Well, we see this in verse 1 as Paul is just explaining this general truth. The law has jurisdiction over somebody as long as they live. In other words, the way to get out from under the law is death. You understand it to be true. When was the last time you saw the police in a graveyard trying to serve an arrest warrant? Right? We're at a funeral and they come up and want to ask questions of the dead person. Right? That doesn't happen. When you're dead, you're out from under the law. And then the application for us, according to this passage, is that because we are united with Christ in His death, we are also out from under the jurisdiction of the law. Your death with Christ, which is part of your union with Christ, removes you from the sphere in which the law has that absolute jurisdiction, in which the law regulates our relationship with God. However, the situation is not quite as simple as those illustrations I gave about the, the graveyard and the funeral. It would take a complicated illustration to explain how death frees us from the law and yet we still live. But that's what Paul is doing in verses 2 and 3. He's giving that sort of complicated illustration that gets the job done. So, a married woman is not free to marry another as long as her husband is living, right? The law regulates her relationship there. Prohibits her from marrying another. She cannot belong to another. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. The law no longer applies to her. Death has released her from the law. And then Paul says, you know, likewise for the Christian life. Look at there verse 4. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. Who are we free to belong to now? To Him who has been risen from the dead. Death releases us from the law, and yet we live. And we belong now to the resurrected Christ in glory. We can belong to Him and live out our identity in Him because through His death, we are no longer bound to the law. We are no longer living in this relationship where the law regulates our relationship with God and condemns us when we step out of bounds. You see, you can't live out your identity with Christ and belong to the law at the same time. So we die with Christ to the law so we can belong to Christ. You see, we can't belong to Christ and the law at the same time because they're mutually exclusive as they both offer different ways of having life. The law says, do this and you will live. Christ says, come to me and I will give you life. So we can't belong to both. We can't live according to both systems at the same time. Therefore, Christ has to break us free from being under the law, under the system that promises life as a condition of obedience. So we belong to Him and have his life freely given to us. And think of that hypothetical person I mentioned earlier. They truly love Jesus, but can't seem to stop living as though their relationship with God were regulated by the law. And it all comes down to performance. That person needs to know that to be united to Christ is to die with him so that you are no longer under the system that, that says, do this and you will live. You're no longer under the system that makes your relationship with God dependent upon your performance. Your relationship with God is no longer regulated by the law. You'll notice that Paul is using the metaphor of marriage here. Belonging to Christ is kind of like belonging to a husband. It's a close, intimate relationship. And see, what, what's going on here then 
Paul uses that, that metaphor of marriage, he uses it several times in his epistles, as a way of telling us that God isn't interested in simply a master-servant relationship with his people. That would be a relationship based upon law, right? Do this and you can live. That's not what he wants. All the way back in the garden, God had a plan for something more than a master-servant relationship with his people. God had a plan for union, a plan for fellowship. God wants to relate to us in, in a in analogy in an analytical way that a husband relates to his wife. In fellowship, intimacy, love, warmth, joy, knowledge, friendship. He delights in us. God invented marriage as a picture of the kind of relationship that we as the church would have with Christ in part now and in full when He returns. And we can't have that that fellowship and intimacy with Christ while we belong to the law because the law is that captor that says, do this and you will live. And Christ says, all that I have, I will share with you, because you are mine. But of course, and some of you may be thinking, well, does that mean we don't have to obey? No, that's not the point. We do obey him. We do follow him. But in, a context, in the context of a relationship where he invites us to know him deeply, we obey him as a loving husband, not as a cruel master. You know, as I read this passage, it strikes me that Paul is most likely thinking of the Exodus events when he writes this. The Exodus is when God took the people to himself, right, in the Old Testament, to belong to him, to be his people. And if you read the book of Exodus, you see that in order for Israel to be joined with Yahweh, their relationship with Egypt had to be broken. The language of the release from Egypt is actually the language of divorce. Divorce from Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt. God had to break the people off from the cruel master, the abusive pseudo-husband, so that he could join the people to himself. And likewise, Christ had to break us from our marriage to the law, to that cruel captor that tells us to do what we don't have the resources to do, like Pharaoh and the bricks so that we can belong to Him. And all that He has, He gives to us. So, how do we not belong to the law but to Christ? By being united to Christ in His death. Second point, what kind of identity do we have with Him? The emphasis here is on kind. The kind of identity that we have with Christ is like no other kind of identity. It's of a, of a different quality, a different sort. Every other identity or belonging that we have is ultimately based on the works of the law. Behind every belonging, belonging to a nation, belonging to a sports team, belonging to a tribe, belonging to a school, is a... Sorry is a kind of identity that says you have to measure up. And even if we've measured up, then we have to keep measuring up. Tim Keller, who just recently went to be with the Lord, gets at this so well in his book, Counterfeit Gods. He, he quotes Madonna. She's worldly, but successfully successful in her worldliness. She's made it by the world standards. But listen to what she says in a moment of honesty. He quotes this in his book. She says this, I have an iron will, and all of my will has always been to conquer some horrible feeling of inadequacy. I push past one spell of it and discover myself as a special human being, and then I get to another stage and I think I'm mediocre and uninteresting. Again and again, my drive in life is from this horrible feeling of being mediocre. And that's always pushing me, pushing me. Because even though I've become somebody, I still have to prove I'm somebody. My struggle has never ended, and probably it never will. I think that's a great description of what it means to have our identity based on the law. We always have to work to prove ourselves. Our identity in Christ is qualitatively different for two main reasons. First, it's different because we are passive. Of course, we are not entirely passive throughout the whole thing. We are active. We do things. 
but we're passive before we're active. If we, in verse 4, we read, you have died to the law, but it could be better translated, you have been put to death to the law. You haven't just died. We've been put to death. This, this underscores our passivity, right? In other words, there's no command in Scripture, die to the law. It's not there. It's not there because there's no way for you to do it. It has to be done to you. And it is done to you in Christ through his death. This is so interesting. The death that Paul has in mind here is very much yours. You have been put to death. Not physically, but, but spiritually being dead to sin, dead to the law, which is even more significant than physically, right? You have died, Paul says. But it, but it wasn't anything that happened in your body that made you dead. You have died, but not in your body. You have died in the body of Christ. You have been put to death through the body of Christ. That's quite remarkable if we think about it. Death is something very personal. And I didn't plan this in light of grieving over, over Mike, but, but it is very personal, right? You die when your body stops working. You could imagine somebody else dying in your place, which of course Christ did, but he did more than that. He also incorporated you into his body in this spiritually mystical way such that when he died, you really died too. And that death of yours in him is what frees you from being under the jurisdiction of the condemning power of the law. But not only that, verse 4 goes on to say that we belong to the one who was raised from the dead, which is to say that we have been raised also in the body of Christ. We died in the body of Christ and we are raised in the body of Christ. This makes your identity in Christ unlike any other kind of identity. Every other identity requires you to do something to get it, or if you're born into it, do something to keep it. Think of the Madonna quote I read earlier. Our identity in Christ is passive. It is very personal, but it is something that happens to you. Christ obtains this identity for us. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, It's by His doing that you are in Christ, who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. All those things that Paul mentions, that's who you really are. Because you really do belong to Christ. And all that Christ is, he really does share with us. The second thing that makes our identity totally different than another identity is that in Christ we take on the identity of a person. Again, this is a bit odd. But our union with Christ is unlike anything else. In Paul's metaphor here, we used to belong to the law. And as I said before, behind every other belonging is a belonging to the law. That means that in every other thing we belong to, it is ultimately impersonal. Marriage is perhaps the only exception to this, but it's interesting that marriage is the thing Paul uses to point to our union with Christ, our belonging to Christ. The kind of belonging to the law is, is the kind of belonging that uh, creates division. Sadly, we see this being played out in America right now. If I belong to something that you don't belong to, then I might not like you. At least that's the way the world works. And you might not like me. Or if we belong to the same thing, then we're in competition to see who really belongs. Right? Who's a more authentic member? Belonging to the law is impersonal, and it ends in isolation. But we've died to the law so that we might belong to a person, to the risen Christ. We have died to the law so that our identity can be not just in a thing, in Christianity, as an ism, but to Christ himself, the glorified and exalted Christ. We belong to him. We have our identity in him. Let me just underscore this by taking a quick glance at another passage, which I think will help us understand this idea even better. This is Philippians chapter 3, 
Matt, as I'm listening to you, I'm realizing that cross-references are important. So this is your cross-reference. I also want to look at this passage because it's often alleged that Philippians 3 is, is not compatible with Romans 7, and I think that's a mistake in how both passages are read. They're, they're really underscoring the same thing. Philippians 3 is all about how Paul used to have confidence in his flesh, right? Um, you're really well trained in your Bibles to actually go there. I was just going to allude to it, but, but this is even better. Um, Philippians 3 is all about how Paul used, used to have confidence in the flesh. And, and listen, confidence in the flesh is a law-based identity, law-based belonging. Paul says that if anyone else had confidence in the flesh, he had more. He's a a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to uh, to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness that comes from the law, blameless. Note that Paul is telling us who he is by telling us what he belonged to. You see that going on in here? He's a Pharisee, a member of a group. He's a Hebrew of Hebrews the most authentic member of that group. One New Testament scholar, Grant McCaskill, has some, I think, very helpful in exploring what's going on here. And he says that these things that gave Paul confidence in the flesh were like badges. You know, badges that you might earn. If you accomplish something, you get a badge. And that shows what you've done and also shows what you belong to. I got this merit badge, so I belong to this group of people because of what I've done, right? All of Paul's identity markers are badges that Paul wore because of the works of the flesh. But then what does Paul say? He says, all that I have I now count as loss for the sake of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. What Paul is doing here is not simply replacing one set of identity badges for another. He's not saying, well, I I used to get a badge for persecuting the church. Now I get a badge for building the church. That's not what's going on here. He's replaced the whole badge system with knowing Christ personally. It's a different kind of way of having an identity. A different way of belonging. Paul is turning his back on the whole badge system. Because at the end of the day, Paul wants to know Christ. Paul says, I want to know Him. Paul says, I seek to lay hold of the one who has laid hold of me. See that passivity before activity. To get at this another way, at one point in Galatians, Paul describes his non-Christian days as a time when he was, quote, advancing in Judaism far beyond my contemporaries. In other words, I had far more badges than anybody else my age. But then Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. That means there's no longer an I to get the badges. But Christ who lives in me. This is the opposite of advancing in a law-based identity. Paul is not concerned with advancing his identity anymore because Paul has Christ. Friends, these truths in Romans 7 and Philippians 3 are are so important for us to consider. Because even though we belong to Christ by faith, even though we have our identity in Him, and we know that, and we sing about that, and we hear messages about that, even though all that is true, there is always this temptation, as Paul says, to begin by the Spirit, and then try to be perfected by the flesh. There's always this temptation to gravitate towards a law-based identity, to, to want our works to count for something, to advance us in Christianity, to do things in the church to get us in that inner circle, those badges. Let me tell you a little bit about my journey. As I said, I originally did this message for pastors, and I shared a little bit about my life as a pastor, and perhaps this will be helpful for you. I was a pastor for seven years, and at first it was really easy not to find my identity in the church because the church was a complete mess. I could go back there and say that to them today, and they'd be like, yeah, we were. 
Other people had really messed it up. I just inherited their problems. I would go to pastor's meetings, and everybody knew me as the guy with the really messed up church. And they'd all want to take me out to lunch and encourage me. It was great. But then, by God's grace, the church began to change. God's word had an impact on the church, and it changed. It grew. People were converted, and there was life there. And although this was wonderful in so many ways, it became a challenge for me to not let my identity get wrapped up in the state of the church. I'd go to pastor's meetings, and instead of being the one who had the messed up church, I'd be the one who had the not as messed up church. And I'd wonder, am I doing as good of a job as these pastors are? Do I really belong here? And after a while, I had to be honest that the problems in the church weren't because somebody else had messed things up, it's because I had messed things up. Being a pastor is a lot like being a parent, that you see your own errors reflected back to yourself. There were times when I was pathetic. I would get up and preach God's word and then feel defeated because the new family didn't come back or that family left. Or one time, I remembered clearly, there was someone I was so happy that he was there. And then by God's grace, he fell asleep in the middle of the sermon. At this point, you might expect me to say, and then I understood the gospel and everything changed. Except that's not how it often happens. I understood the gospel the whole time. I understood that what I was doing was pathetic and wrong. And I was fighting it, sometimes more effectively than others. That battle never goes away. God put Romans 7 in the Bible because he knew that you and I would always be tempted, would always be sort of pulled towards our identity in something law-based rather than in the person of the risen Christ. Finally, how then shall we live? Look there at the end of verse 4. Turn back to Romans 7 if you turn to Philippians. Look there at verse 4. We belong to the one who was raised from the dead. And then in verse, the end of verse 4 it says, in order that we may bear fruit for God in order that we may bear fruit for God. This new quality of identity and belonging translates into a new quality of life. Now, this is somewhat debated. Not all commentators are are of one mind on this. But I lean towards the view that bearing fruit for God is still under the, the marriage metaphor in the previous verse. In other words, I think it's as... One, one Puritan pastor, Walter, Mar- Walter Marshall, interpreted the text this way. He says, As a wife brings forth children through her union with her husband, so also believers bring forth fruit through their union with Christ. In other words, just as a wife could never have a child all on her own without her husband and say, Hey, look what I did. So also it's impossible for believers to produce fruit on our, their own and say to God, look what I did. No. The fruit that pleases God can only come about when we engage with Christ in the relational bonds that He has established with us. He creates the union. We die in His body. We are raised in His body. He brings forth the fruit in our lives through our union with Him. That's how it works. Paul restates the same idea in verses 5 and 6. He says, while we were living in the flesh, that is, living in the law-based sinful identity, our sinful passions were aroused by the law. Sorry, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not the old way of the written code. The old way of the written code was to have our relationship with God regulated by law. And notice, notice that the sinful passions were actually aroused by the law. The law does not result in holiness. Do you realize that? Sometimes people run to the law because they're scared that they'll be unholy. The law is going to make you more unholy. Our sinful passions are aroused by the law, at least When we say the law is going to make you unholy, we mean the law outside of Christ. The law is a rule-based system 
where you have to obey in order to live. That is only going to exasperate sin. That's what it says there in the text. In the text. How do we actually live in a holy way? The new way of the Spirit is to have the Spirit produce fruit in us. Paul is clearly just building off of what God predicted for his people in Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36, God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. Paul's quoting that. I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. Notice what God is predicting for his people there. It's a relationship of belonging, right? You will be my people. I will be your God. And it's a relationship of fruitfulness. Fruitfulness that God calls us. I will cause you to obey. And this is what Paul is saying is now fulfilled for us in Christ. The contrast between the written code and the, and the Spirit is, among other things, a contrast between what is internal and what is external. The code is something external. It exists outside of ourselves. It is impersonal. Everything depends upon us keeping it. But the Spirit is inside of us. He works fruit in our lives. We learn in the next chapter of Romans that this same Spirit is the Spirit of adoption. The one who makes us belong to Him. That's what adoption is, right? We belong to Him. And the Spirit works in our hearts that we would cry, Abba, Father. Listen, Abba, Father is the cry of Christ. It's how Christ addresses the Father. It becomes our cry in our union with Him. The Spirit causes that relational turning to Christ through which the fruit is produced in our lives. We, we don't know how to pray, but the Spirit prays on our behalf with groanings too deep for words. The Spirit works that relational closeness. Listen, the Spirit's role is not to give us the extra oomph we need to raise our spiritual game so we can finally have the strength and determination to live rightly. That's not how the Spirit works. That's actually a very Roman Catholic view of the Spirit. It's not a Christian view of the Spirit. The Spirit is first and last the Spirit of Christ who works in our hearts the person of Christ to make Christ real in us, to make Christ known in us. Christ in you, the hope of glory, Paul says. Well, there is much more we could say here. I am almost done. But I want to give you a couple of specific application points. Now, getting really practical here is a liability, honestly. Because when people want to get real practical here, sometimes that's code for, okay, so sometimes what do I actually do based upon this is code for, now show me how I can turn this into a law. Right? You see how that works. But on the other hand, the way forward is not to abandon anything that we do, right? It's clear from this passage, we should walk in a new way. We serve in the newness of the Spirit. We, we actually do something. We serve. One way to avoid that misstep of turning practical application into a, another law is to keep the marriage metaphor in view. I think that the marriage metaphor is governing this passage. So let me give you three application points through the lens of that marriage metaphor. First, because we belong to Christ, we should pursue relational intimacy and closeness with Him. Remember, the kind of belonging we have is a belonging to a person, not a system. To Christ, not Christianity. So the Christian faith is not about advancing in Christianity as you would advance in your education or advance in your career. It's about knowing a person more deeply. It's about knowing Him because He has known you. That's why prayer is so incredibly important in the Christian life. If you don't speak to your spouse, your marriage will flounder, right? If you don't speak to Christ... You won't be living out your union with Him. 
Christ wants to be with us. He has come. He has taken on our nature. He has lived a perfect life. He has suffered and died in our place to free us from sin and the law. And He has raised us up again so we would belong to Him. He's done that to establish a relationship with Him. Respond relationally. Respond in prayer. Respond by knowing Him. Pursue relational closeness with Christ. Second point. The rules that govern our Christian life should serve the relationship. Again, look at this through the marriage metaphor. Sometimes people, especially after they first get married, have the mistaken assumption that to have a good marriage, everything has to be spontaneous. They don't want to schedule times together or date nights because they think that won't be relational. But after you've been married for a while and had one to five kids, um, you realize that life gets a bit crazy. And sometimes the, the most relational thing you can do is schedule dates or structure your life to have time together. That's a good thing that serves the relationship. And sometimes husbands and wives create rules for themselves of what is okay or not okay to do with people of the opposite sex, right? Um, or maybe they have rules for transparency and texting and email, or etc. This structure and these rules can be a great help to the marriage as long as they are done for the sake of the relationship and not as an end in themselves. If your spouse says to you, you feel distant, you can't respond, well, look, honey, I've kept all the rules. I don't see what your problem is. You can't ever think that keeping the rules earns you something. Look, I've kept date night every every week for three weeks you owe me it doesn't work like that you can't earn the affection of your spouse by keeping the rules in the same way it is good for us to have structure in our christian life it's good for us to have commitments to read our bibles every day or to pray every day there might even be times where we schedule this and even record this so we can understand realistically how much time we're actually spending but the goal is to know a person better Furthermore, God has given us rules that we must follow. These aren't optional. He tells us to flee sexual immorality. He tells us to not forsake the weekly gathering of His people. We need to obey these rules. But they aren't ends in themselves. They are there to guard the relationship. Finally, last point. Expect tension as we live between the now and the not yet. Again, the marriage metaphor helps us here particularly the way in which Paul uses the marriage metaphor differently in different parts of Scripture. Sometimes, like in this passage, Paul speaks of the marriage metaphor to describe our present belonging to Christ, the relationship with Christ that we have now. And sometimes, Paul uses it to talk of that future day when Christ will return and He will truly and fully and completely take us up unto Himself. Both are true. Both are getting at the same thing. We belong to Him now. We are absolutely His. That's true. That's final. And yet, the fullness of what it means to be His has not yet been revealed. There's a sense in which we are married to to Christ, the church is married to Christ, and there's a sense in which we are only engaged to Christ, awaiting the final consummation. So expect there to be awkward moments when your feelings don't match what you know to be true, and when circumstances in your life don't match the fact that we really are belonging to the King. What we need here is two things. We need a realism about how severe sin has, how much sin has severely affected our lives. We, we need a realism about the pool of idolatry and the way the fall leaves even our bodies broken. We need to be realistic about that. And yet we also need a faith-filled biblical optimism about the fact that God's Spirit really is living in us. And so the life of Christ really is being manifested in us. And that our past failures don't condemn us because He has broken us free from the law. And there is hope. And there is encouragement. We need both. But one day Christ will return. 
And even our physical bodies will bear witness to the fact that we belong to Him. Because He will give us a body like His. And the whole world will be made new. So, who are you? And what do you belong to? We will always belong to something. That's how God made us. In our sin, we belong to the law. And it rules over us. But Christ has come. He has died and rose again that we may belong to Him and have our identity in Him. And we will bear fruit with and for Him. Let's pray. Our God, we thank You for the, the truth <clears throat> that we are truly dead with Christ and raised with Christ. That, that His physical death and, and physical life is, is ours in Him. And that that means that we are genuinely new and have a relationship with You that is genuinely new. Lord, we pray that, that this truth would be something we can inhabit. We would be implicated in it more and more. It would be a lens through which we see the world. We pray that we would make connections in our lives. It would have explanatory power for the, the things that have tripped us up and gotten us stuck and for the ways in which we have been fruitful unto you and that we would see this passage as we would see our lives through this passage and conform our lives more and more to the reality of our union with Christ. Help us in this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.